but it's not exclusively found with alveolar proteinosis. And pneumocystis is one of the frequent imitators of that pattern. Yeah. Okay, that's uh, that's my case. Very nice example of that. All right, thanks. Okay, uh, Howard, you want to show now? All right, sure, I can do that. Okay, this is a, a patient that we have currently who's being worked up for transplantation in the context of very severe pulmonary hypertension. This is um, idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. And of course, wiped right off, you can see on the radiograph the degree of pulmonary artery dilatation and enlargement of the right atrium and right ventricle. So this is a non-enhanced CT that I'll show you next. And we've shown cases like this before, but this is a particularly dramatic example of some of the pulmonary findings one may see with any cause really of severe pulmonary hypertension of long standing. And what's really conspicuous is, is the mosaic attenuation pattern. But in addition to that, there are multiple foci of ground glass attenuation. So subsegmental sized, patchy if you want to use that word, ground glass attenuation in the lungs all over. It's obviously heterogeneous. And I'll show you something else in, the mo in a moment. But what I think this represents is what was described as this in this particular paper, so-called neovascularity. They described this in the context of Eisenmenger syndrome, but they did have, or well, they made an attempt at, in part, CT and histopathological correlation. So they're showing vascular, vascular abnormalities, but they're also, in some of these images, are showing foci of ground glass attenuation. And I'll just go right to what they found in some of their imaging slides. So basically they show a variety of things that they believe make up this pattern in part. So basically clusters of dilated tortuous muscular arteries within alveolar septor, dilated congested capillaries within alveolar tissues, vascular lesion consisting of congested capillaries surrounding medium-sized muscular pulmonary arteries. But they separate these from the lesions of so-called plexiform arteriopathy. So they're saying that some of what we see on CT represent these kinds of vascular abnormalities that one may see in pulmonary hypertension, separate from the pathology that pathologists are used to seeing, which is the plexiform lesions and the dilatation lesions and so on. So that's what I think this person has. And I'll just, sorry, go back to that. Didn't mean to do that. And just look at that again. And give you a feel for what that looks like throughout the lungs. And then the other finding that this person has, which we're more used to seeing, but this one is a really nice example, which I'll show you on the mix, are the very tortuous corkscrew pulmonary vessels. So I'll just scroll through it kind of fast, but I'll stop in areas where these corkscrew vessels are rather conspicuous in relation to the smaller pulmonary arteries. So here's one particular one in the right middle lobe, a very corkscrewy vessel. You can see one here. I'll make this up a little bit. And I'll just pick up a few really corkscrew pulmonary artery branches. Some people call these Sheehan vessels. There's a nice one over here and here, particularly nice example of it, these corkscrew pulmonary artery branches. So this person has nice examples of both of those findings um, in the lungs.
power can you go back to the axials again in the right lower lobe anteriorly near the fissure there was one of those vessels and we were trying to figure out if there was an was it a, an avm or just a tortuous vessel right here somewhere right, right, here. right there right right there right, right there. there right there yep that's that's that um yeah that's a vessel sorry okay I said it was in the right middle lobe, but it's actually just behind the fissure. But that's one of those very tortuous, particularly tortuous vessels, right? That we saw in the right lower line. Right there. Okay. Here is a interesting patient with the history of a type B aortic dissection a long time ago. And there are two really big interesting findings in the chest at the time of imaging here. Of course, there is the very large dilated aorta. But the first thing that was really troubling to us were findings consistent with a leak of blood into mediastinum. So separate from that aorta is this region. And we know we told them about that. They didn't consider her an operative candidate otherwise. So they elected to, to watch her. They didn't disbelieve us, but that was quite concerning. And the other thing that is interesting is the pattern of calcifications in relation to the false lumen. So let me show you that. So up here, we'll have true lumen and false lumen, but this is a lot of thrombus in false lumen. Let me just try to pick up another one. Actually, this one is nicer. So here we have a relatively small lumen, a smaller pacified lumen of the false channel, and then a lot of thrombus in it. And then there are areas like this down here in which question is to what extent these are actually calcifications in the false in the clot versus contrast medium but we do have a pre-contrast to show that there are calcifications there so let me show you fairly dramatically how much calcification is present in relation to the false channel here so we have a lot of very strange calcifications some are clearly peripheral in relation to the false channel. Some are seemingly inside of the clot of the false channel. And it's really unusual to get these peripheral calcifications. And this is a really dramatic example of that. And I found a couple of articles uh, describing calcifications like these in the context of chronic dissection. So look at this one, for example, this picture in this particular article showing very similar calcifications. Let's have a look at this one in which they describe these calcifications. So here we have peripheral calcifications in the wall of the false lumen channel of a chronic dissection again. So this one's really, really dramatic in that respect. So it does happen. I don't know why it happens. Anyone's got theories about that, but this is a really dramatic example of it. So they elected to um, just observe this lady. They didn't. They didn't operate on her. Here's an interesting one that we had just the other day, and I'll show you the history in a moment. Slip my bearings. Okay, so we have, I'll put the history alongside and you'll see what they did as well. So the history here is of a person that really did come in with chest pain, which he described as being located to the left of the sternum, radiation down the arm. He has chronic chest pain, but this was acute and was rather intense. So in the context of that, he was imaged with a CTA. And here is a lesion, which was interpreted as, and I think very reasonably, as a 
penetrating atherosclerotic ulcer. It's certainly a very focal abnormality. Here is some thrombus or abnormality related to the wall of it that was diagnosed as penetrating atherosclerotic ulcer. Does anyone feel that this is not that? I know it can be hard to distinguish between an ulcer with intraluminal thrombus, but this is pretty focal. Could we see it on, um, on coronal or SAG? I have the feeling this is a duct aneurysm. Oops, that's post up. Sorry. I think these are tough, but I, while you're pulling that up, I can see both points. I think I would probably say if he's symptomatic, it's probably a penetrating ulcer, which may have, you know, complicated a ductus bump or a ductus aneurysm, but certainly in that area. I guess the. How about the SAG? Okay. You know, here's some intimal calcium and there's thrombus in there. It isn't obviously hyper attenuating. See, a penetrating ulcer isn't going to have calcification associated with it, but um, in the it, periphery, it, yeah, exactly. What could? I think this is a this is a hard one. I think mm -hmm. in actually describing it as a penetrating, but certainly with that history, they certainly proceeded it rather quickly to put in a stink, which I'll show you in a moment. Howard, the only thing that bothers me a little bit, and I may be wrong about this, is there's not, I'm not seeing atherosclerosis anywhere else, at least of what you've shown. I mean, he doesn't have a high burden of disease anywhere. No, that's true. That's true. It doesn't. I mean, we sometimes see plaque there, but just that much abnormality considering there's nothing distal to it or in the subclavian. That's right. That's all true. And so Howard, there were acute symptoms associated with this, this, this person was. Yeah, I mean, he described as being quite intense in the morning, waking him up from sleep, radiation down his left arm. Mm -hmm. His chest pain in the past has usually gone away after a few hours, but this morning was more intense. As you see here. So the so calcium. What to make of that? Associated calcium, and then it should be something chronic, a la, a la aneurysm, and we don't think that's the ductus or ligamentum arteriosum calcification, do we? Or do we? No, I don't think so. You see, you wouldn't get that with a penetrating ulcer. It, it wouldn't develop acutely. But what do you guys think about a a, a focal IMH there that eventually? ulcerated i don't know if this is just thrombus in the lumen of the artery it's not very attenuating it's relatively small i think these can be really hard to know exactly what this is i mean it's abnormal but is it an acute penetrating ulcer with associated acute intramural hematoma or do we just have an aneurysm with clot in it? And the contrast medium just basically lies up against the clot in the focal aneurysm. I, uh, I, think, I think penetrating ulcer is probably the most, the most convincing thing given the acuity. And there may be, you know, he doesn't have a lot of calcium, but he's got a little calcium there. So there might've been some atherosclerosis there that promoted this uh, penetrating ulcer in that location. So uh, I, you convinced me about penetrating ulcer. It's got that nice button. Yeah, I don't know. I, yeah, I, don't know. I would have been perplexed by this mm -hmm. as well. But they certainly went in and put a, a stent there. And I'll show you the post-op image, which also shows an unusual finding, which surprised both me and the surgeon. And even though we looked at it together, we couldn't quite decide what it what it means. So let me show you the post-op. So that is on the 15th, he had surgery 
about then. So here we are just post-op imaging six days later, prior to anticipated discharge. So here is the endovascular stent graft. They elected when they did this, as you can see there, to actually do a transposition of subclavian artery to carotid artery at the beginning of the operation. And that transposition up there looks okay, post-op up here. And you can see the stent and you can see the excluded portion of the proximal native subclavian artery here. But let me actually show you the axial first because I didn't anticipate seeing this. So I'll make this bigger. So this is the immediate post injection phase and then this contrast medium right there surprised me because the stent looks okay. And then all of a sudden right there, this contrast medium in that location and it basically comes out. This is where that process was. And I showed it to him and he said, I don't know what that means. He was kind of surprised by that too because it's not coming from the proximal landing zone or the, the distal landing zone. So it's not a type one. And I still don't know what that means. He said, is there perhaps some kind of defect related to the fabric of the stent? Uh, we were just perplexed about this. And of course, they're just going to follow that. But I still don't have any idea what this is right there on the immediate post-contrast image. I've seen dozens of these. and and You've seen a lot of lots these? Lots of times, like people, people try to make these into type one or type threes. I, I think that it's probably just like there's a little bronchial artery or something that it looks like. I, I don't know. I've never seen one that had a like a truly one that was proven to have a hole in the fabric. You know, right. Like you said, there's no proximal type one. Right. So I don't know what to make of it. Here on the corona, you can see where it's coming off or where it's seemingly coming off from the lumen of the aorta right on the undersurface right here, right? Well, but the fabric's so thin that I don't think you can just conclude that it's a direct communication. With the lumen, that is. But I mean, it's yeah. contrast and it's rather bright, so it's coming off, it's it's coming from somewhere. Oh yeah, no, there's definitely but a contrast there, I think. I just wonder if it's a, if it's retrograde filling, because you see there's a little bronchial there, but then of course the, the counter argument of that is that it's just antegrade filling of that mediastinal vessel. But. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think I've encountered that before, so I just didn't know what to make of that. So it's a curiosity. I don't know if anyone has any better ideas, but otherwise it's doing fine. And instead, I will just follow that. Didn't seem to be too bothered with it. <laughs> okay. Um, this is just an interesting um, pathology result. So this was a patient that had, was a really good pickup of a small opacity on a radiograph somewhere. And the end result, out of that was a workup and she went to surgery. And it turns out that the opacity that was seen on the radiograph that was a really good pickup turned out to be this one. And that is a pretty typical heart solid, had no carcinoma. And then we found on CT preoperative imaging, this lesion. So that's lesion number two, which has maybe pseudo cavitation. Lesion number three is that one that's either completely pure ground glass or just maybe a minimal um, opacity associated with it. So those are three synchronous adenocarcinomas in this particular person. Um, we saw another one here. We don't know if that's a scar or something else. And there's another very, very small ground glass attenuating opacity pure in the lower lobe. But we know this happens. So this one has three lesions. They found all three on, in the specimen, lobectomy, and just described it as multifocal adenocarcinoma. 
with some lipidic growth. But um, a nice demonstration of, of three synchronous lesions. And we certainly see that right there in one lobe. Okay, Jeff, those are mine. All right, thank you, Howard. Travis, Peter? Sure. All right. This one's kind of interesting, and I'm curious if, if you have encountered, if anyone's encountered this before. So this is a man who has a UIP pattern. Some of these cysts are big, uh, but he was diagnosed with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and transplanted almost two years prior to his acute illness or his acute issues. The pathology was consistent with UIP, and that's not really pertinent to the the acute issue. Let's see, let me get some dates up here. So this was his first trans first outpatient transplant CT. Everything looks reasonable. You just got a little bit of scar and atelectasis and whatnot and he was doing okay and then you'll see that around october of this year maybe even a little bit before and he's got a little bit of ground glass back in april of 2019 and it's not just in the right lower lobe it's a little bit more elsewhere but you'll see as we fast forward worsening ground glass in october he's got declining pfts worsening shortness of breath is it rejection? Is it some sort of infection? We don't know. Uh, long story short, the bronch was negative then. This was in November. They did another bronch and transbronchial biopsy. And I don't know if anybody saw the answer when it was up there, but if you want to take a guess on what this is, because it's neither infection or rejection. No. This turned out to be secondary alveolar proteinosis. And I have not encountered this before in, in lung transplant patients. There was one patient at UCSF maybe like 10 years ago where they had a similar thing. They found alveolar proteinosis, focal organizing pneumonia. And in this case, they think it's probably his immunosuppression, the, the everolimus that he's on. So he has since stopped it. This is the more recent CT that we saw. This is when I encountered this case last week. So, or a couple of weeks ago, maybe a little bit of subjective improvement in the ground glass. But the more important thing is his pulmonary function tests have improved over the course of a month since he stopped it. And he's symptomatically doing better. So for presumably it is secondary to the immunosuppression. And hopefully it will continue to get better. Have you guys seen this before or not in any of your transplant patients? Because it's not just lung transplant that this can happen in. No. This is the case. This is one case, and this was a case of a lung transplant. And this one had just more like ground glass nodular opacities here. You know, similar findings on this one actually went to a, a bat. This is a more interesting one though. This was a this was a case series of four cases of patients who had, you know, some of them had single lung transplants. And it was interesting that the alveolar prognosis only occurred in the transplanted lung and not in the native lung. Now, all four of the patients in this case series died. I think case four looks very similar to the one that I showed you here. They don't comment in here about altering the immunosuppression. Serolimus has been reported in, in multiple cases. There's even been case reports of it occurring in the lungs after renal transplant, but I don't know. It's I thought this is very interesting. Yes, indeed. And I can't, I don't know enough to get into the, the mechanisms of the interaction with the macrophages and the, the GMCSF, but the idea is I think that at least our pulmonologists are treating this as being attributable to the to the immunosuppression. So change the drug and he's getting better. Yeah, it makes me wonder how many times I've seen opacities and never thought never recognized the, the possibility of this because I, I just didn't yeah know it. Oh. I mean we we trans I don't know how many 
many thousands of lung transplant patients we follow now over the last 15 or 20 years. I guess this is only the second case we've encountered that we've recognized. This is a quickie, you know, a nice radiograph that I came upon recently. And, and I showed a similar one in relation to the patient that had bad bronchiectasis, but this is a patient who's an outpatient. And if this were on the left side, you might say this is left upper lobe collapse if you expected to see the ellipsical here. I'm curious what you guys think of this lucency in this area, because the lateral looks just like a left upper lobe collapse would look with the, the left upper lobe being pancaked anteriorly. Of course, on this side, in this case, though, it's the right side. You don't really see, what's that, David? Could that, could that be esophagus, Travis? Oh. No, I think that I don't know. it's no, the Because yeah. the patient's rotated to the left, so the esophagus should be to the right of the uh, to the tray. They're not really, but they're not really that rotated. But this so, is all volume loss, and and notice how the the right heart border is gone here too. So this is a a case of you know the analogous or the analogy to left upper lobe collapse would be combined right middle and upper lobe collapse, and you can see on the there's loss of the intermediate stem line there's a little bit of increased soft tissue there and you can see that here's the right upper lobe and here's the right middle lobe that's knocked out too so, you know, so the, Travis, the, yes go ahead and scroll, scroll on down there's a very nice uh, so this is really the loop sickle on the right side here yeah and there's you're you're and you're pointing to the v that generates the loop sickle right there and then if you go down, there's a nice uh, juxtaphrenic peak on this case too. And you can see that that is the, um, that's the medial basal segment of the lower lobe. That's an yeah. inferior fissure. And it's traction on that that generates the loop sequel. So people still are confused about, they call this traction on the inferior pulmonary ligament as the cause of the juxtaphrenic peak and upper lung volume, upper lobe volume loss. But it's really traction on inferior accessory fissure. A nice example yeah so so what is but this is yeah what is that was my question like this is the equivalent of the lipsicle but what is what is causing the the tenting it, here is this from the hilum i guess yes it is it's from the hilum because this would this is like i guess superior segment of right lower lobe correct so yeah okay but I really like your juxtaphrenic peak um, demonstration here too. Right here from the inferior accessory fissure. Right. Yeah. So I just thought this was a, a, a fun one because we don't, you know, we rarely if ever see this. So. And the cause of the collapse was uh, what? Squamous cell carcinoma. So there, there's tumor in the right upper lobe here and there was also lymphadenopathy. And I don't know, I never got the bronch report. I, I don't know if it was just big right hyler lymphadenopathy slash mass. Something's knocking out the right middle lobe here as well. Mm -hmm. But sparing the right the bronch, lower lobe. The bronchus intermedius is. Well, the bronchus intermedius is okay. Yeah. Right here. Yeah. So right so upper lobe bronchus intermedius yes. is okay, and then the right middle lobe bronchus. Right, so you have to have two hits to take to just do right. the right middle right. and upper lobes. Yeah. So That's why you know, we so rarely see it. Felson used to make a big point of this as being the double lesion sign, which was an argument arg argument against cancer causing the uh, lobar collapse. So he says in order to take out the upper lobe plus the middle lobe, you have to have two lesions. You can't do it with one lesion. But there are more cancers out there, and so even though yeah, um, there are a lot of cancers, and so you're, you, most of the cases I've seen of this double lesion sign are actually cancer. So it's a great theory, but it doesn't play out in terms of right. what you. Yeah, the other thing that this shows, you know, if you think about the the aerated lung in that upper medial right hemithorax and the opacity that's lateral to it, that that sign is called the elephant ear sign of combined right upper and right middle lobe atelectasis. So if you think about it, you can imagine that white thing on the radiograph 
is the elephant ear shaped kind of opacity. Mm -hmm. So I think this is also the so-called um, elephant oh. ear sign of combined right upper and right middle lobe volume loss. So if you Google, you can find, I've got one example of it, something like this, but it's described as the elephant ear sign. Interesting. I've never heard of that, so I'll yeah. have to look that up. It's kind of a big flappy uh, white elephant ear yeah. on the right side. Yeah, kind of. All right, Jeff, I'll stop there. All right, Peter. Uh, sure, I have two. Awesome. This was kind of an interesting uh, case of a patient uh, who was on ECMO and got scanned again for a pulmonary embolism. And it's interesting because it's, it's abnormal uh, for several reasons, but one of the things that happened here uh, is that instead of cannulating a vein, they cannulated a peripheral artery on the left side. So you can see the contrast is coming in arteriorally um, and then tracking up through the subclavian artery and then subclavian, subclavian artery. Uh, and then uh, it kind of stops right here. And you have essentially very little contrast that track of the bolus that made it back into the descending aorta. Uh, but if you go down, there is contrast in the, in the uh, LV apex and the coronary vein. So I think, I think that got in, into there through, the patient recently had a, a a few days before the scan had a cabbage dog. Uh, you can see contrast tracking down, down um, I think through the slema, and then presumably made it into the LV through uh, the vision veins and into the corners. So, uh, um, and then the, the other thing to, to note here is uh, they have a they have a impella device, and if you look in the IVC, there are two two catheters in there, two cannulas. So this patient was actually switched um, recently before the scan from veno uh, arterial to veno venous uh, uh, veno from veno arterial so from VA ECMO veno arterial ECMO to veno arterial venous ECMO. VAV ECMO, uh, and then so that required the place, but that's an escalation um, of the ECMO, and that requires the placement of a second uh, cannula in the IVC. Oh, um. So, you, so you can see here on this on this radiograph, there's two now. There's two cannula uh, in the IVC. From after the switch to veno arterial venous ECMO, which I hadn't, uh, I didn't really know much about until I until I saw this scan. And then this on the prior, so the, the day before they only had one. Now, what do you have any sense of why they? Yeah, so them? so I have to look this up. Uh, I don't know if you guys if you guys had seen this before, but uh, so the theory, the theory about it is that. Um, is with the is that with when you put somebody on veno arterial um, on VA ECMO, ideally you should have good um, circulation of of so in, in figure A you should have good circulation of uh, oxygenated blood throughout the throughout the body as it comes in through the femoral artery cannula as oxygenated blood returns. But in reality, what the theory is that what happens is you get this um, this these two separate circuits so. Uh, they call it dif uh, differential hypoxia. So you have this, the oxygenated blood coming in through the femoral artery, but it doesn't it doesn't make it up to the to cephalad to perfuse the lungs and the in the head and neck, and so it just stays 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 in the lower uh, in the lower body and circulates here. And then you have a separate circuit up up top, which is uh, basically powered by the left ventricle, but it's deoxygenated blood. So that's the problem with the VA ECMO. And so they, the way they, 
in theory, what they think they, the way they can fix that is they'll put a, a separate cannula in the, in the IVC. So you have a return, you have an oxygenated um, blood returning into the femoral artery, and then they're also returning it into the inferior vena cava. So you have two returns. And then you also have blood coming into the ECMO through the, uh, through the IVC. So it's veno arterial venous ECMO. Um, that's like that's the the next next level of escalation after VA ECMO, but it, it seems like a lot of this is is still still a lot of this is just a little bit theoretical. They don't it doesn't I'm not sure if they have uh, data to support how much this this has helped. Uh, and this patient ended up not making it. Um, oh. Yeah, so you can see on the scan. You have the, the two cannula and that and the IVC. So one is actually returning oxygenated blood to the into the IVC. As well as there's also already returned into the femoral artery as well. Um, you show my next case. So this is this is a patient in his mid seventies from um, Vietnam, and he he was having um, abdominal pain. He went to his PCP, and his PCP uh, was worried about appendicitis, so he sent him to the ER, and he got this abdominal CT in the ER. You can see the appendix. Here is normal. Um, so the only abnormality that was seen on this scan was in the descending thoracic aorta right there. And so there are a few things here that are suspicious for this being a uh, mycotic aneurysm. Um, there's this low attenuation, but then there's this haziness around it. It's like stranding. So it looks like inflammation. So this was read as a Ulcerated, ulceration with some kind of non-specific inflammatory um, stranding around inflammation around it, um, and the patient was tested for uh, he got blood cultures and it didn't seem like he had an infection at the time. Uh, they also biopsied his uh, temporal artery and that came back negative for vasculitis. Uh, and then um, a PET scan was done a few days later. And it showed this. So it was all this inflammation right where we were expecting, right around the aorta. And so our surger, surgical, I'm not sure exactly what the the reasoning was, but they uh, they they decided to go ahead and stent it. Um, and then this was the most, and then so they, they stented it and um, they did a few serial CTs afterwards, but this was the most recent. It kept like slowly increasing in size. And this was the most recent one uh, from January, uh, from a few days, for a few weeks ago, uh, significantly increased in size. Now, the interesting thing is that initially, when he came in, when he presented in October, uh, blood cultures were negative, but then they were, they were positive. Uh, they became positive. He got new cultures in, um, December and they were positive for salmon, salmonella and teridides. And so I, I looked that up and apparently salmonella, which uh, is one of the most, uh, is one of the bugs that's known to cause uh, mycotic aneurysms. And there's, um, I looked up a article, for example, so this article just a case series of 16 cases of uh, mycotic aneurysms from salmonella. So my theory is that, um, he he because he initially presented with abdominal pain he could have had a, a enteritis from some he maybe he ate something contaminated got an enteritis and then got a bacteria eventually got a bacteremia which seeded his aorta it's really that they weren't really able to find out another other reasons why he got that focal mycotic aneurysm there oh. Uh, that's all that's I got. Really, that's dramatic. Wow. Right. So, was there anything down? Go down on the original scan. There was that just yeah. black, or is that more 
aortic involvement. And further down in the abdomen, there was one little area. So in the ab it seemed like there was atherosclerotic plaque further down. Yeah. Right. Yeah, okay, right there, that little eccentric. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, wow. I just have one case I can show. <clears throat> So this is a 33-year-old female who has metastatic um, adrenal cortical carcinoma that's been sort of progressing over time. And she's got a lot of metastatic lymphadenopathy um, kind of all through the chest. And she's had these pleural effusions. And this area right here, she has large subcrinal lymph node metastasis. And, it's just been hanging out, slowly getting bigger. And so she presented uh, with increased shortness of breath. And um, there was concern that the effusions were getting bigger. The one on the left is already pretty sizable. Um, and they, was, she was evaluated. They weren't convinced how big it was or whatever. So they decided there was some other things going on and they opted to rescan her at the time. So just shortness of breath. And um, what was seen here was you've got, um, so her, there's her cancer there. You can see the left pleural space is more complicated now. There's less fluid, a lot of thickening. So there's tumor in there. And now the right pleural fusion is larger. I can put them up side by side here. The right pleural fusion, uh, there's the desynchronization. Yeah, there we go. The, the right pleural fusion has gotten larger, but now it's more complicated as well because um, there's now this collection posteriorly here. You can see the lung kind of stuck around it. So uh, and some gas bubbles in it. And at this point, they had not instrumented the right pleural space. And then you can see in the subcrinal lymph node mass, there is now, uh, this is probably esophageal lumen here. You can see it's kind of compressed up there and it's been pressed up there for some time, is all this new gas in the mass itself that was not there just about a month or so ago. That's all lumen of the esophagus on the old scan. So, um, just there looks like there's probably a little connection between the lumen here and then this gas. And then there's a, a collection between all this gas right there. And then this is the pleural space. Mm. So it looks like a esophago lymph and adenopleural fistula. And, um, they did, uh, eventually drain this out. And Chris, you said they got Kyle. Well, the maybe. preoperative diagnosis was Kyle. I yeah. didn't see it. I didn't see final. Report. Yeah, but yeah, but uh, but they haven't. Um, you know, I don't think anyone's going to at this point put a scope down there. But it looks like a a fistula, and it's something we don't see very often. You see it with tracheal tumors, squames. I've seen it with. Um, we've seen some, you know, communications with the aorta, and I've seen TB uh, erode into a structure from the lymph node. But I've never seen a metastasis like this just erode in the esophagus. So. It's unclear if what, what caused that, if it was just tumor necrosis maybe, because it's always sort of pushed the esophagus out of the way. It's never really encased it, but um, it's definitely communicating with the pleural space here. So just kind of a wow. real, yeah, bad case. It's hard to, in static image, it's hard to show the communication, but I think you can see there definitely is a little right in there, a communication in there. So new gas in the pleural space is presumably coming from the esophagus. Interestingly, there's you don't really see anything outside the lymph node. There's not really pneumomedia sinus. It's all contained within this mass. And now she's just dropped the right lung. So I haven't seen any follow-up imaging thus far. And that is all I have for the week. It's been kind of a quiet week. Anybody have any extra cases they want to show before we wind down? Let's see. Nope. Nope. All right. Well, we'll end a few minutes early. Thanks, everyone. All right. Bye. Thanks,